the two on Wheel Live. This is 2OF Entertainment. We're back. We are another week. Yeah. Another week. Another week, and we are are indefinitely into fall here, where we are. No, we're still into summer. Are you great? Yeah, we have. Well, there's two summers, I guess. So it, this in the mornings in Celsius, it's like 23, 24. You know, it's not bad. No humidity, and then by noon, it's like 33 Celsius. And birds are exploding in mid-flight. So uh, <laughs> that's what we get. So welcome no, to Austin. Late. Uh, birds are getting ready to de-ice in our area, and so they can get in the air. So, so they're, gonna, they're heading down <laughs> south. They're gonna, I don't know if they're going to go to Florida. Florida seems to be getting hit by a lot of hurricanes. They're probably going to come to Texas. Yeah, well, they can maybe change their migratory route. Yes, maybe we do something. Yeah, we're not going to. Well, we're not going to change much in our area as far as migration goes. We're just going to keep on going with, I guess, our art content that we have. We have, you know, we have well, we have a, a unique situation and an artist is today and Loretta Favari and uh, we're going to talk about her journey which is it's maybe even different than a lot of other artists but oh wow some are maybe going through what she has gone through and so you know struggling as an artist with some health issues and with you know some other things we will talk about um they're hard they're hard subjects to talk about <clears throat> using art as health um, as re you know, in recovery and, uh, and and getting it out there a little bit, so it's sort of right. like um, I, I don't I don't want to get too much into. It. We'll we'll talk about it with her and let her explain her what's how she's gone. I was going to say if you keep going through it, we'll do the whole show and we'll bring her in to say hello. Yeah, it'll be time I, to go. Yeah, we'll talk about her behind her back. It's like Loretta, we're glad you're in the green room, but uh, Paul and I've decided we'll do the show and we'll just ask you to come in at the very end. So. <laughs> Well, right, well, let's bring Loretta in and then I can disappear and you guys can actually talk about Loretta's art and her and what's going on. And I've seen her site. So it's gorgeous. She's getting ready. I, she's doing this. So we want to let her make have her take her time. So we don't want to yeah. catch her. Yeah. Up. Like, it's not like it's a surprise. Right. I mean, you know, but here we go. Loretta, welcome to the show. Thank yeah. you. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, we're happy so to have you. Good. And now I'm going to disappear. And okay. you and Paul will now discuss for the art aficionados all about art. And I'm going to draw my stick figures. So I'll see you guys at the end of the show. Cheers. Okay, well, for sure. Yeah. Well, good day to you. Good day to you. Yeah. Well, you know, when I when I received when we talked about having a show, and I went, oh my God, this is this is this is what a lot of artists need. They they need mentoring in a different level. They need sometimes some artists really recover, you know, they lackadaisically some of them go into the art studio and produce the art they love, you know, and the peop the art that people love. And how deep is the art that they create? Like, where does it come from? Their heart just, or is it just spontaneous combustion on the canvas? And you go, how deeply has it been thought of, right? I, and, and I think we are all at different levels in our art creation and why we create our art. Um, and we all have our own goals and aspirations and dreams about what it's gonna do for us and some, you know, probably most of the time you might meet a couple of times you have little huge joy moments where things happen and people connect. I guess the word is connect. That doesn't even mean buy because I think a lot of your work is installation based. Is it, is it not? Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and I, I feel that um, uh, I like you and, and so many other artists, I, you know, selling is wonderful. Um, and I, and I started out that way, just sort of creating things that I just thought were cool. Uh, yeah. and that, you know, I think people would connect with and like, but, um, and I don't know if you want me to start getting into this already is why, why I stopped you, doing that. You, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you start wherever you like. Okay, I mean, all right. it's, so, your, it's your journey. And I think, I think it's, it's, it's unique, right. And why, you are doing what you do 
I think it's really important to tell people about that. I mean, uh, it's a brave thing to do. It's, it's a thing, you know, that we, you know, it's sort of, um, there, there is a coming out at some point and saying, how do you, you know, the support factor that you received through grants and funding and some of those things for your programming that you did. We'll talk a little bit about it, then we'll start images and I'll have uh, Stephen okay. put them up, but just okay. a general talk about what we're going to, what, what okay. you're about. Yeah. So I kind of shifted from making art uh, to quitting alcohol. I, I quit drinking in 2018. Wow. And uh, my, I, I went to my, my family doctor and said, this is what I want to do. I want to quit drinking. And she referred me to St. Joe's uh, Health Center in Toronto um, and hooked me up with a, an addiction counselor. And she invited me to join a recovery group, which I did. And at the same time, I also started an online uh, course for artists. And you may have heard of her, Anne Ray. She does a course called Making Art, Making Money. And I, I went through that course and that course, wow. I mean, it, it forced me to dig really deep into why I make art and to determine what my purpose as an artist is. So I was doing that concurrently with being in recovery, figuring out, you know, why I drink, why, what, what is, what's the um, foundation of my addiction. And through both avenues, I discovered that I had been carrying around a lot of shame from my past. And, and it, you know, it's not like it was it's constantly invading my being, but just that it kind of haunts me every now and again. And I found it was holding me back from achieving goals as an artist and as a human being. Uh, so that's when I kind of uh, was inspired to, well, also looking at how I make art and, and being highly critical of the work I was creating. You know, if it wasn't perfect, then, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put it out there. So I created this bin of my rejected prints. That's what I was making at the time. And uh, so I, inspired by one of the women in my recovery who would write in her journal and then tear out the pages and tear them up so nobody could read it. And I, 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 nobody wanted, she didn't want anybody reading about her angst. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. That's so cathartic. <laughs> so I thought, well, let's take this a step further and, you know, tear through this work that I think is awful and uh, stitch it back together and create something something new from it. And uh, it, it's sort of a, a metaphor for healing, stitching, mending, and um, and letting go of the past and creating something new. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, we always talk about we should get rid of that pile of paintings, go through them and sort through what's good, what's not. Let's have a fire and let's burn them. And they, a lot of people are reluctantly you know they might get rid of a few pieces of art but i know most artists have stacks of stuff that you can't sell i mean a lot of it is uh it's just there it's it, it's inventory but it it's it's stagnant it's sitting there but it's great to rejuvenate mm -hmm. I, I find that artists a lot of times especially after you've been painting or drawing or doing art for a number of these 30 years or so it's cyclic you tend to go back to maybe a little bit where you early days of starting um, and, and you re acquaint yourself, I guess, with what you used to initially love doing in the beginning, especially if you go through that, I need to sell my work. Right. Um, so in the beginning, it really doesn't, it isn't like that. It's produced work for yourself. And then as you get going to, you know, maybe you better start selling and stuff. So you start selling the work and everything and you forget about the love that you had at the very beginning for what you were doing as you move through your career a little bit maybe it's done well maybe not but you you tend to say where oh i write that old paint I, I like that imagery that i used to do and back and you reacquaint i said with it again so do you find yourself i guess that's that tearing aspect a little bit you go back to those pieces that were sitting in a pile and you go do it you know am i going to sell it probably not but what am I going to do with it? And creating a new piece of work from it. Now we'll talk about 
like you're in. I'll get Stephen to start the first image up here. There we go. Now he can go to sleep somewhere in the corner while we talk. But uh, the uh, I, I guess I'm looking at um, what, what kind of funding did you get for your idea and your concept? Like this, what we're going to talk about is basically one show that you work through a process from, right? Is, is this what we're going to do well, in an installation? Is, this is the work this that I was selling. This is actually a framed, a small, well, not small, okay, this like, one yeah. yeah, 20 inches by 20 inches uh, framed. It's it's what I what I was doing to sell my work. Ah, in the early days, yes, okay. In the early days, yeah. Um, so I was kind of obsessed with uh, utility covers, and to every everywhere I went, I would take photographs of utility covers because I, I liked the patterns in them, and I thought they were really cool, so... This is a, um, a utility cover in Cognac, France. And uh, I would take an image and then through digital manipulation, create a stencil. And then I, I would print it um, using, this is using washi, Japanese paper. Right. And create the stencil, uh, sorry, create the print. And then the stencil, I would hover over top of the print. so. This all this red bit that you see here is the stencil, and then right. I curl it, and you can see the print underneath. And it kind of creates a sort of a three D thing uh, that I was doing, and and this is this is basically all the kind of work I was creating at the yeah. time. So for 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 clarity, a utility cover. They're manhole covers, basically in the road. Is that is that what mm -hmm. we're talking about? Okay, so. <laughs> I, I had a love of that too. I mean, I'm walking around Ottawa and some places and they've got some very beautiful old manhole covers. And uh, I thought they would make amazing shirts. Like the, some of these covers, are uh, the textures on them and the, actually visual imagery that have been cast into them. And so, so yeah, this, this feels very oriental to me, you know, it, uh, the, mm. the piece of work, I mean, the circle alone uh, and then the red, the color red and some of those things are just, beautiful so so there you are doing art you're looking down at your feet most of the time and walking around on roads and looking at i mean you even say that you're looking at your covers and cracks in the road and the abstractnesses of um i guess that the texture that we walk on you know there, there's this the roadway that we take the pathways that we're going how how deep are you thinking when you do that like are you thinking about the final process while you're working, while you're walking and looking for things? Um, I, I initially, it was just, I was attracted to the patterns in, 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 in the, um, in the ground basically. Right. Um, but once I started making these pieces, then I started really looking for, um, imagery and patterns that I know I could turn into something. Right. And so, yeah. So this one was in France, this one that's on display. So are they much different like in Canada or other, other oh, countries when you're off? Yeah, they're very different. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, I, I, I love the ones in Toronto. I, I, took, I did lots of, of um, not just the uh, manhole covers, but uh, the, the sewers, the grates as well, because some of them are really interesting as well. In Japan, I, uh, my brother-in-law lives in Japan, and we went for a visit. And the ones there are stunning. They're beautiful. They have um, they're colored. They have ceramic. They're kind of made with a ceramic inlay. They're they're just gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> well, you know, there's there's probably a whole art form in that foundry area mm -hmm. that produce these pieces of work for the cities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a number of other artists have done them, but they, they seem to be uh, out, out of view. Like people don't, they're not, they're not being presented to the world as an art form because all these foundry, they had to be produced by an artist at some point, those foundry pieces. Yeah. Uh, and they would be produced in, in volumes, quite volume. They'd be ordering. I know walking through different sections of Ottawa, for instance, you'll see they'll change like they're, you know, by year or by order number, or by section of the city. I don't, I don't know the reasoning for a lot of it. Some of them just have number castings on them, which are kind of cool in themselves. Uh, 
and the size has changed too because some are for water mains and some are actually for mm -hmm. drain and some are yeah. just for access to under the road so uh actually i've got a couple that have a fish on them um in the in the drain yeah. system which i did i did a, i did a few pieces with the fish as well yeah and then somebody told me that the reason the fish is there is to um uh, educate on environmentalism that you know there it, when when water goes down those drains the fish are affected by whatever goes down there so if people are dumping crap there then it will affect the fish yeah it's not that's made. what i was told i don't know if that's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a warning for toxicity though in your water. Mm -hmm. So don't pour uh, oils down there. Don't pour in, pour stuff that are down there. It's mostly just a water drain, and uh, that's what that that fish mm -hmm. symbol stands for. That there's life at the other end of that water. But uh, yeah, we'll just I think we'll just go on. This is a beautiful piece. That's another one. So now we're getting more into some of your uh, ethereal things. So there, I mean, the things that are. Are these some of the torn pieces that make up this one? Yeah, how all these pieces, all these pieces came from my reject bin. So a lot of them are are um, prints that I I made of utility covers that I didn't like, uh, or colors that I was printing with that I didn't I didn't really like the colors. Of, I don't know who knows. So all these different reasons I I ditched these pieces and then I went back and tore them up and. Uh, categorize them by color and then um did uh, this piece in particular i i kind of meditated on it first for a while because when you're when you're when you have this pile of bits it's like well where do <laughs> i begin how do i how do i compose something right uh, so i just sat in front of my grid paper i use grid paper as my starting point so i put grid paper on the wall and uh, just sort of meditate on that grid paper and uh, close my eyes and try and visualize something um, as a place to begin. And that's how this this came into being. Yeah. So they're like, you call it here, captured moments in blue. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think the circle is, is, a, is, a, is a big factor for you. Like, are you attracted to... The circle, I see one right behind you, a nice red one in, on one of the pieces of New York. So <clears throat> is that is that a hard shape to work with, like generally? Um, not really, because the, the grid paper is what grounds me. Um, so as long as whatever I'm, I'm putting together, like a circle, which, yes, I do like circles, um, it, it, as long as it, I can capture it within the grid paper, then it's easy. Like the, the grid paper is my rock. And within mm -hmm. that uh, st structure, I can do whatever I want, which is, is very uh, freeing in a way. Yeah. Now you, you refer to this as the art of forgiveness. And yes. Can, can you tell us a little bit about how that comes about? Yeah. Uh, so when I was doing Anne Ray's course, uh, she encouraged us to look at the person who was suffering in the past, being me, and what would I tell myself? What would I tell that person, my younger self? Um, and it was to forgive yourself. And so that's where that all came into being. So the art of forgiveness, it all, and it's not just forgiving what happened to me in the past, it's, it's forgiving my inner critic for making those judgments on my own artwork that self-criticism and that self-judgment and just sort of forgiving it and letting go of it and um not beating myself up about yeah. the work that i've created right and i think i think a lot of times artists are really hard on themselves um and and, and sometimes it's justified because that uh, they they can go through their body of work and say yes that's that's presentable this one it means something to me but it's not presentable but maybe how do i make it presentable that in in a context to my say a body of work uh, do you find that your work is kind of lyrical like does one piece kind of tell a story and does do they all hook together and tell the bigger story that's a good question i don't i don't i don't really know because each piece is kind of i mean i'd say yeah it is kind of lyrical uh, each piece within itself, 
but I'm not sure other than than the the concept of forgiveness is what ties them all together and the the the, the captured moments these these pieces of the past being um, captured in this mesh right that so this so this grid that this one is sitting on is that a loose it is a loose grid right that that yeah so yeah. it's so uh the grid paper uh, i i i build the image on the grid paper with a um temporary adhesive so i'm tearing through japanese paper sticking it on the grid paper and then i stitch through the grid paper so that i follow the lines of the grid so i'm stitching each each line that you see there um is a line of stitching okay. and then I stitch through the grid paper. Once I'm finished, I remove the grid paper and that creates this ethereal, um, uh, very uh, delicate kind of mesh. Yeah. yeah. It feels very kind of lace-like a little bit. It, it is. It, yeah. And delicate. How, how big is this piece by itself? That <clears throat> piece is um, about 33 inches by 35 inches. Yeah. Okay, so it's a it's a nice piece to see on the wall. If there's some, yeah, it's not just yeah. it's not like a little doily this big, right? It's no, just, no, it's quite large, and and there's it has a companion piece as well that's red. Okay, yeah. So again, pieces are speaking to each other. Those so this, two, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. So, yeah. and I always ask this of people: do do those pieces as we go through what we're going to show here? Um, you you have an idea that's holding it together, uh, your concept how does that spark in your brain? Like when you say, okay, I got an idea for the next one. I got an idea for the next one. Is that, is that inspired by the pile that's there as what yeah, can I make? Oh, totally. Like it just happened to me because I just completed a body of work and, and now I'm like, my brain is already going, I'm all, I'm looking through my <laughs> bin and I'm going, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know where I'm going to go next. Oh, I'm great. very excited actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, that it's great to have that excitement because it's just like, like where do ideas come from? Like you give a ment. I find after a major show, I'm kind of I'm kind of worn out for a week or so. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's kind of there's there's a point that you want to just go sit there and look at the body of work because you can't put everything up in your studio. There's just too much stuff. But if you ever get a gallery situation, that's great. So does some of your stuff is meant for public galleries? Is that public showings? Yeah. Is that more than commercial? Um, the art of forgiveness. So this this piece that you've just shown, and um, and this is the close up of it. Uh, and there was a sort of series of, of a body of work that was called the art of forgiveness, and it was shown at the Craft Council of Newfoundland and Labrador. Right. In yeah. Twenty twenty one, I think. <clears throat> yeah, right in the the cuspus of COVID. Uh, yes, it was. That. Yeah. Which really affected a lot of people. Um, did did that did that put a I don't know I don't know a lot of artists found it gave them a bit of a positive spin on the actual just stuff they're working, not just being careful, but it, it kind of gave them a lockdown sense in their in their mind more than anything that to stay indoors and get that work done. Um, did you find it a productive time? It was a very productive time, yeah. but not because of covid i think it was because i quit drinking and right. i i like a fog had lifted and i was just very inspired to 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 work yeah yeah i think uh, i love i love moments of inspiration and they they do get interruptions so do you get interruptions in your in your life relative to the time that you've allocated to doing art like yeah you, yeah yeah I yeah, and it's mostly it's mostly family stuff. Um, I, 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 my studio is uh, in my home, which is on nine acres in Gray County and in Gray County, Ontario, and um, and that there's a lot of work we've been doing around the property, uh, so that that takes a, a chunk of time uh, as well. But I do have a, I don't, I don't have a, a day job, which I'm so grateful for. So I do get to spend quite a bit of time in the studio, which is, which is yeah. lovely. 
Do you, do you have a collection of manhole covers that you've been taking with you as you go on a trip? You, you sneak some way, put one in your suitcase? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of photographs, though. Oh, my God. Like, I have a ton of photographs. And I, I kind of, uh, when I quit drinking, I decided to give up on those. I Because I felt like looking at the ground was also... Um, sort of symbolic of, of emotionally where I was at. So mm -hmm. I try not to look at the ground anymore, like, you know, to hold my head up and experience the sky and um, the beauty of other things around me. Yeah, this, there is a psychology with head down um, mm -hmm. in, in, I guess, when you're walking and you don't meet anybody else's eyes, you, 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 you lessen that contact with people, I think. And like you said, if you lift your head up, now you're forced to identify with engage. what's around you and yeah and engage is really yeah no this is a lovely close-up it, it feels very uh i don't know it feels like these floaty pieces of paper in the sky you know what i mean it's just like mm. they're caught in a wind and be, this is a little snippet of the piece but of course and uh this is a gorgeous piece <clears throat> yeah <clears throat> people now getting the sense of what you mean when you're cutting these pieces up and create a whole new body of work from these pieces um, and collage. It's kind of collage, you know, it, it, is. it, it has it a collage, is. but you're always looking for rhythms and shapes and it, there's an abstractness to these things that, uh, and they're, and they're gorgeous. I mean, and this one is a little bit bigger than that. I would think this is probably, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So this one is uh, the um, 60 inch uh, by 50 inches or so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah do they do they tend to be delicate it's like to maintain hang install like um they're, like they're more resilient than they look okay yeah. but but again they yes they 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 are they can be torn uh i guess that hasn't happened yet yeah. and and they've been around a lot so that's good but um I, I wax them as well. So this particular piece hmm. is uh, from my 1992 journal that was filled with angst, you know, <laughs> in my early 20s and, you know, everything was upside down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? You can relate. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been in my early 20s. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, took, uh, I took pages from that journal and I... I kind of defaced them with ink and wax using a batik process. Right. And then I and then I cut them into squares. So this one, whereas the other one, the blue piece we were looking at was torn pieces. This yeah. I actually cut into squares and stitched them all together. Oh, yeah. No, you're, uh, it's uh it's a gorgeous piece. I mean, you you you're looking at something here that you don't really know where it came from. Like mm -hmm. as, a, as a viewer myself going and says, you don't, I don't see the angst. I don't see, I mean, you'd have to look at each and every square. <clears throat> you'd have to look at each and every square on here. Yeah. And, but so when you work on these, do you work on a light table? Do you work on a, just a big flat surface as you move these items around? Because this is somewhat gradating light to dark in a, in a sense <clears throat> and little yeah. snippets. that was on purpose the the dark to light and yeah. uh, just sort of a uh symbolic of letting go and being comfortable with the past so mm. where the dark part is me covering up that angst but then yeah. letting it go and and letting it reveal itself as you move up um there's so a sense if you were looking at it up close, you'd, you'd see the handwriting in the lighter areas of the piece that kind of then disappear into nothing. Yeah. Well, it has a sense of going towards a light. Like there's a, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a beautiful piece. So how do you ship something like this? Is it usually kept flat? No, I, I roll it, <laughs> um, which is really easy. It's so uh, uh, the whole series of, the art of forgiveness. When I sent it to Newfoundland, I I rolled up each. I, I layered pieces with mm -hmm. um, craft paper, and then rolled them up and stick them in a um, 
a tube, you know, one of those sono, sono tubes yeah. and, yeah. Um, and sent it to Newfoundland. I think I, I split it into two. There were two sono tubes filled with the, the pieces. Very efficient way of sending things. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, that's a close up. That's a close up of the writing and that on those, on those panels. Yeah. Yeah. You know, each one is a piece of work. Like each one is a, is a, is a, is a, a drawing painting in itself. You know, if you even them leaving them as they are, I mean, especially this red one, it's just go, this arched red line. I would imagine it's when you turn a page, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the conversation changes that in your book meant one thing now that you've cut it up and you've put it in and turned it a little bit i mean i i haven't seen your the journal in its in its time but that's a separate piece even though it's been cut and trimmed and and placed so there's but it in context to the writing and some of the other just drawings um that are you know they're they're gorgeous especially at the top right corner there's this, what is that drawing of, right? You just, they're beautiful drawings. Um, so those those pieces of work though, it was a white on um, uh, black gray backgrounds. How were they created in your book when you did those? Just with wash and ink? Um, so I, I tore the pages out and then I lay them out on a flat surface. Uh, so the, the journal pages, um, were just regular journal pages lined. Um, and then once I tore them out and I lay them on a flat surface, I applied ink. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with some textile tools, but there's this um, little tool called a janting tool. And it's a little um, cup that you fill with wax and it has a, a, a little needle on the bottom with a hole in it and that you can draw with it. You're so drawing it's wax. It's kind of a batiking process. It is exactly a batik. So yeah. that's where you're seeing all those little lines and things. Uh, yeah. Is the and and I used other tools, um, mark making tools, and then I would apply the ink um, mm -hmm. as well uh, on top of that. Yeah. And remove no. the wax. Right, and you just iron that out usually when you're done. Yeah. 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 No, working with a uh, block out, I used to do drawings with uh, silk screen block, mm -hmm. and things like that. So it works the same way. It's kind yeah. of thing. Exactly. Uh, not as easy to wash out, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you just work with it. Wax works good. I just found like um, there's been some acrylic batik painters. So they'll they work with wax and acrylic and they do landscape painting <clears throat> and occasionally you can see the drip marks uh where they're carrying wax across the, the mm. paper to put in apply it and it'll drip from the brush um and then they just build the layers up and at the end they iron it out but once the wax is done down on the paper there's no it's not receiving any pigment at all you're done like yeah. It, yeah. You know, yeah 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 but i love the grid system on this thing it feels um there's 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 a psychological thing of a fence right mm, yeah a, a fence and a barrier you can see through but you can't get to mm -hmm. right so there's mm -hmm. i love the psychology of that a little bit and uh, it's not barbed wire but it but it's still a barrier and and those grid lines they kind of that's how they kind of see that it's uh interesting now yeah. we're getting some of the bigger pieces these things are really abstract and colorful i love that. yeah yeah i love this um so this is uh when i was working um in my recovery group and i had now developed this new um creative process for myself i wanted to share it with my recovery group and because i thought they could they could benefit from from this process and i applied for a grant and partnered with the St. Joe's Health Center and my addiction counselor. And um, we got the grant. So it was COVID uh, and I wasn't sure how we were going to get this group together to, to work together, but we managed to figure it out through Zoom. So there were 13 participants, including myself and my addiction counselor. And I created toolboxes 
for each participant and I either delivered them to their homes or they came and picked them up again during COVID. So everybody was had to be really careful when we were around each other. Um, and then, and then I did uh, 10 two hour sessions through zoom and yeah. sorry. No, I'm good. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm okay. listening. <laughs> yeah. So the first hour was my addiction counselor doing her thing. Like we usually did in our recovery groups, which was usually a, a topic of discussion. Um, all our topics were related to recovery and, and, uh, tools for overcoming shame and, um, uh, all, all kinds of different topics that she kind of organized and also doing um, mindful meditations as well in that first hour. And then the second hour um, was my hour where I would take the participants through different mindful exercises like doodling, drawing the breath, uh, creative, um, uh, cathartic writing. And we were working with little squares of paper Japanese paper, which was donated very kindly by the Japanese paper place in Toronto. And, um, and then, and then we'd go through the mark making process and we use the jelly plate to yep. create, um, prints. And, and so we were creating layers of, of, of expression and experience on each piece of paper. So it would start with doodling and writing and drawing, and then we would apply a layer, a print, and then we'd put a print on top of that. Um, and once we were completed the whole process, we did a ceremonial tearing, tearing through our shame. So uh, every participant had a stack of prints that they'd created and, and um, we tore through them, stitched them back together in squares. So each participant created uh, nine squares. And then those nine squares were all uh, stitched together. Oh, we also shared, we gave each other a piece of our artwork as a, a form of sharing our, our connection with each other yeah. um, and, and, and stitching um, our part other participants' piece into our own piece. And then we stitched the whole thing together. Um, again, through COVID, so everybody was being really careful. Uh, they would come to my studio and, and we'd, we'd start stitching uh, the piece together. And so here we have this giant quilt of 13 people's um, shame torn and stitched together to create something really beautiful. So this is all on paper, though. It's all yeah. on paper. So it's not on squares of material, but it's become yeah. this quilt that's been stitched together. So the stitching, you did you use thread basically to stitch with? Uh, we used we used warping thread, which is a mercerized cotton, which is very strong, uh, really colorful. It comes in all different colors. It's a, it's a really beautiful um, tool to work with. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's... Some close-ups of the uh, quilt. Yeah. So, so a lot of these, the stitching. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the stitching is really, um, uh, what's the word? Um, it's not precise. So no. all, all these participants really had no experience in art making since they were kids. And, uh, and there was a lot of anxiety just around creating something. Yeah. And then it came to stitching and a lot of them hadn't ever stitched before. So uh, I just showed them very basic technique. Um, basically go in, go out, go out. It didn't matter how they stitched as long as the pieces held together. And, and really what it created was people got really expressive with their stitching. It was, it was really cool. Some of the things that came out. Yeah. There's, there's eight or 10 different, it's like handwriting. Yeah. It's, it's very much like handwriting and you could tell which person stitched a certain way. Um, you know, some look like little chicken footprints on the snow and then some, uh, you know, they, they, uh, the, the one in the middle almost kind of has this, uh, you know, reverberation line like you'd have on a, a, a monitor on your heart a little bit. Right. You know? So you, I can see a very a lot of, a lot of different techniques. Yeah, they're they're very individual, and, and you never thought about that. Stitching is could be very individual, and uh, because a lot of times in stitching they want it to have kind of a mechanical look to it. 
mm -hmm. for the for strength and techno you know the technical look if you're going to look at it say you're stitching a, a dress or a seam you want them stitched in a certain way if they, if they do show up they look precise and they have a nice rhythm yeah. to it otherwise it looks like five-year-old did it right yeah and uh i don't see any blood on here from people poking the <laughs> finger or anything <laughs> no, no it all worked out really well it was it was great yeah this is a piece in itself. I just love the abstractness of this, just this slice that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. The the lay, but you know, you don't just go in and produce this piece. This is layers of ideas. Like that, like you don't get to this stage at stage one. Some of these are five stages away from where they started. I mean, you can still see some of the uh, wax drawing that's in one of the other prints in behind and then the layering that they that one goes over top of the other to give you these pieces so so working from with i guess you worked on zoom with your mm -hmm. other members and yeah. <clears throat> so how did that work with them is it mostly conversational on the zoom and then they go to their their rooms and studios and produce work and next week they have another session and they show what they did and you everybody has like show and tell uh -huh. No, we did everything within the two hours. So, Continue. yeah, yeah, and then and then they come back next the next week, and we we go through the next stage um, of the process okay. until we were complete. It was completed. Okay, so everybody basically could see what everybody people were doing. They're working because you had the the gallery images up. Or you could see everybody that was there yeah. in in your group. Okay, yeah, no, that was a great thing. I think um, COVID created a lot of us to to work with uh each other in a different way um on screen rather than uh in person mm -hmm. uh, different type of a conversation happens you know on a zoom for instance than if you're in person <clears throat> so here's one of the installation pieces yeah so, so this are one... they... sorry. sorry okay go ahead. no go ahead um, so this piece, uh, I was approached by Claudia Arana, who's a, a curator, and she was um, she was hired by the City of Toronto to create an ex three exhibitions uh, in the west of Toronto for Artworks TO, um, I guess 2021 or 2022, I can't remember, was the year of public art. Yeah. And... Um, so she was creating um, three exhibitions related to homeland. And she asked me to create um, a community engaged piece that related to homeland. So we called it the Forgiveness Project Homeland. And uh, it's really very similar to what I did with St. Joe's and I created this big fishnet and took people through the same process of doodling. Uh, we didn't, we couldn't uh, do printmaking. Like people who just walked into the gallery space uh, couldn't participate in all aspects of the creative process, but they were encouraged to draw, doodle, write, tear, and stitch into the fishnet. <clears throat> Each piece and and the people were asked to reflect on homeland and what it meant to them and homeland could be the place they came from or the place they came to mm -hmm. um, it didn't have to relate to homeland it could relate to anything they wanted to let go of or um, you know tear through as a as a form of uh, healing yeah so how long was that installation up uh, while they worked on it it was there for April till September. Oh, so there was a, a good lengthy period of time. A long time. Oh, and then we we burned it. Uh, there was a ceremonial burning of the piece. It, it was sort of the final gesture of um, out of the ashes comes new growth and new beginnings. Yeah, I've seen a few other artists doing that, and it it there was one guy in the states who worked in cardboard, and he produced this massive massive piece in horses and all kinds of things and was based on an italian uh sculptor then at the end he burned it he was and mm -hmm. it was from new york and it was going he worked on this thing for years wow it's like 
and uh, they had sold cardboard pieces in between, but these things were life size. They're huge. And then he at the gallery and they let the rain rain on it and got it wet and it got to a certain point. They just uh, loaded it up and put it in the dumpster and off it went to the garbage. Wow. And what was his reasoning behind bur burning the piece? Just letting go. It was uh, mm -hmm. letting go. And uh, I can't remember the artist's name, but I can, I can get that to you. I watched it on, a, I guess it was a YouTube. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think um, also the whole idea of, of, burning or, or tearing through work that you've created. It, it doesn't have to be work that you didn't like. It can be work that you loved and, and, and um, tearing through it or burning it or it is, is a, is an act of letting go because we don't want to get too attached to even the things we love because they can disappear. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, I can see it, it is. Um, it's just an interesting concept. To, yeah. to let go of things that we're attached to. Yeah, a lot of times we let go of things we don't want. Yeah. You know, or we've lost interest in or mm -hmm. some of those things. And it, it's tougher to let go of things you love, um, things that you've nurtured, things that you've spawned ideas. And you say, you know what, there's still ideas in this thing. Why would I want to get rid of this thing that has, I haven't finished drawing the energy from these pieces that were, I'll go through, I've got, tons of sketchbooks but rarely would i burn or tear from my sketchbooks because i go oh my goodness there's there's ideas there that i love to revisit from time mm -hmm. to time it's like a good book I don't yeah know, yeah i um, agree uh, those things but i can see if the book was was built for healing to start with um you know place to put your ideas in your angst and all those things in it and if it's part of the project, I guess I'm saying that. So mm -hmm. now you've taken that book and now you tear it and now it's part of the next stage of that project mm -hmm. yeah. to, to the to the final stage of what is what was it meant to do or what have you created to allow it to do? I think that's that's probably more. So here's the piece. Yeah, uh, that's it finished. Yeah, big beauty. It's actually beautiful, you know, and, uh, you know, quite colorful. And I and I and it's one of I've always thought that art is a universal language in itself. So you don't need to speak English. You don't need to be able to write. You can do a communication visually. You could be of any country, and uh, in, in a, anyone can come into this gallery from uh, you know New Canadians and whatever language doesn't mean anything. Just tell us where you came from, what you did. I love the concept. I mean, mm -hmm. and you know what? You're putting it with other people of the community. So mm -hmm. now you're connected. You've created connections with people in your community, not only when you're producing the piece, but when you installed the piece as well, uh, who you're next to. And, you know, and this maybe the conversation while you're in making the piece. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think they are about conversations in a, in a different way. So... But now there's people that don't want to be involved in that, but they come in to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. They walk through, they say, oh, no, I don't want to install anything, but I'd like to come in and look at it. And they read, it's sort of like going through and reading all these little snippets and trying to understand, trying yeah. to understand. I can't imagine understanding it. Like there's so much information there. Like, it's, yeah. But it is really cool when you, when you go up and you look at yeah. each little piece and you can see what people have written and, yeah little snippets it's it is it's really cool did you find you had to keep adding more fishnet to it or was that the deter determined size it was the determined size and the 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 curator asked me to complete about 75 percent of it so i did i kind of i got things going i started it and then everybody else filled in the rest yeah i think that's as artists we understand that's what you pretty pretty well yeah yeah, collaborative pieces are, <clears throat> uh, especially with a large amount of people, um, they take a lot of energy. Um, and it still is kind of your concept. Um, it's sort of started and now help me fill in the spaces with yeah. with the concept. And and that's when you get, that's why I think when you get somewhat of a successful piece, it's, it's rare that uh, you can have hundreds of people being involved in something without so many coordinating it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, into a uh, the context of a, of a great idea absolutely yeah so this one's a little different um 
but you can see the torn paper uh, for sure. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about sure. the figure? Yeah, this is my grandmother. Uh -huh. um, and so out of that forgiveness project, Homeland, I, I was kind of inspired to look at my own homeland, which is Canada, but my grandparents came from Italy when they were very young uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And so, yeah, I, it just kind of got me reflecting on, on my heritage and the experiences of, of my family, uh, particularly during World War II. So my grandmother, my grandfather was uh, arrested by the RCMP in 1940 after um, England and their allies, including Canada, had declared war on Italy and Germany. Um, so, it, so Mussolini was was partnered with uh, Hitler at the time. Yeah. So, um, the Canadian government in, instigated the War Measures Act and registered Italians, uh, Italian Canadians throughout the country, and arrested. Uh, around 600 of them and put them in internment camps. And my grandfather was one of them. And so they were being accused of being enemy aliens of the state. So my grandmother, she uh, was a school teacher and wrote a whole bunch of letters to government officials, to um, members of parliament and the United Church of Canada. My, my grandfather was a United Church minister at the Italian United Church, mm. which is kind of weird in itself. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so she got um, members of, of, of the United Church of Canada to write letters to the justice minister advocating for his release. And um, yeah, and it worked. So my grandfather spent four months in an internment camp rather than a couple of years, like most of yeah. the internees. Yeah. Yeah. We've had the same thing with Japanese and some of the yeah. other people. It was this, the Japanese and the Germans. It, it, uh, it was a it was a time of fear, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I don't know how anything like that would be possible today. But we, the whole thing is crazy. We have enough craziness today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a detail shot of that um, uh, piece, and so what you're seeing here are the let I transcribed the letters that my grandmother oh, wrote. Nice. Yeah, and uh, and I I transcribed them onto handmade paper that my aunt made. She was a paper maker. And before Whoa, she no. died, and she, before she died, she gave me all of her handmade paper that she had. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's a sort of a multi-layered uh, piece. Uh, Cause this, my aunt was my grandmother's daughter. And um, yeah, so I transcribed the letters, which are actually on, the Villa Charities website. So several years ago, Villa Charities, which is part of the Columbus Center, which is an Italian cultural center in Toronto, they created a website documenting the history of the internment of Italian Canadians. And my mm. mother, who had all these letters, she gave them to Villa Charities to scan and put on their website. So that's what I used as my resource. And I just transcribed all these letters. Oh, nice. Yeah. This, this this is a very yeah they're beautiful I love just again the grid <clears throat> um, it's not really straight lines and I just you know they they hold everything together and I love the handwriting it's gorgeous handwriting thank you <clears throat> the world of cursive is dying I think it is it uh, sure is yeah you know, to, to yeah. read to actually be able to read legible uh, handwriting is they had gorgeous writing in those days I mean they it, did it, oh my goodness yeah easy to read. No, it was very so. Yeah. Here's your grandfather, uh, I imagine. That's my um, uncle. Oh, your um, uncle. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't put in a picture of my grandfather because I don't have a really great image of it. Uh, so uh, the irony of this whole incident when my grandfather was um, arrested was that five of his oldest sons, there's nine children in all, the five oldest boys were serving uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces at the time. <laughs> Yeah, very ironic. So I, um, so in this body of work, I have created portraits of 
my grandmother, my grandfather, and the five boys in their military uniforms. Right. And, the, and, the, and, and, and so the idea of this whole body of work is that um, the, the actual tapestry is, is kind of a sepia tone that you, you see it, but really what you're really looking at is the shadow, like, right. a, like they're ghosts from the past. Right. And the detail is in the shadows. Yeah. One, one of our, yeah, one of our other members, Holly Hildebrand, you should look at some of her work. And uh, she talks about um, similar things, but within her family as an, uh, an, an adopted child um, and how the search for her mother and those things and back to the land. And it's, it's just a different journey, but for maybe a somewhat similar reasoning, just finding yourself and 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 centering and things, but her work is gorgeous as well. Um, and Holly Hildebrand. Holly Hildebrand, and okay. that's from in, on Artists in Canada. And uh, we did interview her as well, so we talked about her work, and then some of it's quite beautiful. Well, I really like. Thank you. It's been a short little bit run here, but uh, we will definitely uh, help show your work and I, I love it i think it's uh, it's a great journey are you it was gorgeous did you wait I, was, I took a nap thank you very much it was great i loved it <clears throat> my hair so i look good so no it was absolutely gorgeous uh, like fascinating so the question we always ask every artist if somebody wants to buy a piece of yours what's mm -hmm. it start at what's it go to like from x to y to z so if, or so, i see you do a lot of commission work so someone says i want you to do something so what's like the range Oh, um, well, <laughs> the, the piece, so the, the, um, the blue piece, the captured moments mm -hmm. in blue is for sale and it's partner piece. Um, and to be honest, because I don't sell a lot of work, I don't remember right. what the, the, the fee So is. it's free. So just write it, <laughs> uh, right, Loretta, you get, she just pay for shipping. So there you go. Yeah. Well, that's good. I, that's a good business model. Up. Yeah, but I do have smaller, smaller, like little, little pieces um, right, right. that basically started around two hundred and twenty-five dollars, and then okay. they go up to, I guess, probably around eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars, depending nice. on the size. And they're and they're easy to ship because she rolls them. And I was just going to say right. when she said she rolled them up, I just started to smile. I'm like, now there's somebody using their brain. Not like that. Yeah, uh, we have some artists that will buy something for our stuff. And I'll be like, okay, so I'm going to ship it. I'm like, no, no, you're not putting it in a, like a crate. You're going to undo it, roll it up, and yeah. send it to our framer. They'll frame it. It's, they know how to do that. And, you know, yeah. so they don't get it. So when you said you roll it up, I'm thinking to myself, well, there you go. That's the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Like, and that's not an accident. I Because I was yeah. making framed pieces, and I was just like, oh, my, just storing framed yes. pieces, you know, especially when they're in shadow boxes. They take up so yeah. much space. They do. Yeah. Yeah. No, but your stuff is gorgeous. So if you can't figure out how to get a hold of Loretta, reach us here at the show. We will put you in touch with her. Um, and then she, hopefully she'll remember what her pieces cost. If not, uh, <laughs> you just pay for shipping. So, and there you go. So it's 250 to 1800 is kind of the range Canadian. Yeah. yeah. So for yeah. the people living in Europe, paying in Euro, you just pay for shipping because that means there it's free. Uh, <laughs> in the United States, 50%. So there you go. Yeah. So it's not that bad. So it's great. Well, thank you. And please come back when you do something. Well, all your stuff is wonderful. So I guess next time you do something wonderful, let Paul know. And we'd love to see it. I, I, we, will, I speak yeah, and we will definitely uh, help promote what's going on here. And That's hopefully great. we can get other people connecting with you. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so Very much. Cool. You well, have it was a nice meeting you. Have a wonderful day, nice Paul. Day. Always good to see you. Everybody, yeah. don't forget, we'll be back next Thursday with, I'm assuming, another amazing artist. Don't forget to subscribe and like. Tell your friends. And if you don't have any friends, uh, tell a stranger. And we'll see everybody next week. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah.